course of our investigations enforcing these laws, we encounter a wide range of malicious activity um, from our sort of bread and butter internet fraud where you have the brick and mortar scams that uh, have now sort of shifted to the internet. Um, it's just traditional internet fraud or, or fraud that's advertised over the internet via spam messages or, or pop-up ads or what have you. Um, then you have the spam messages where there might be spoofing, where there might be uh, email messages that are phishing for consumers' personal, personal information. Those messages might be uh, advertising, fraudulently advertising bogus goods. They might also be a vector for malware. Um, and then we've had another a number of cases uh, involving malware where there were either sort of drive-by, um, people got the downloads just by visiting um, a particular website or they were downloaded from an email attachment uh, to a spam, spam message. The malware is really used for a wide variety of nefarious purposes um, and some with keystroke loggers to steal passwords um, or even to compromise the consumer's computer to become part of a botnet. We've also seen some issues with social networking sites, particularly privacy issues. Um, there was one case, Zynga.com, which was actually a, a COPPA violation um, where the, the website uh, collected and used and disclosed the personal information from children under the age of 13 without notifying their parents or the parental consent. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, it really sort of spans the gamut, runs the gamut in, in what we see. And, and we also see sort of a variety of different tactics that these malefactors use to exploit uh, the DNS. A lot to do with domain name registration services, whether it's false registration information, um, whether there's the use of proxy services that are um, the registrants use when they register the domain names, but they're using them to evade detection. Um, whether uh, the bad guys that we're actually investigating are acting as resellers for domain name registrars, um, the frequent transfer of domain names, the short lifespan of domain names, um, the use of special credit cards to, to pay for the registration services. I guess I could say you name it, we've seen it. Um, and one thing that we saw that we uh, recently took an action on was sort of the collusion uh, of an ISP uh, who was hosting sites with harmful content. Um, and in regard to that point, I, I just um, want to discuss this one case example. This was the Price Work case. Um, and the FTC brought an action against Price Work which was really a rogue ISP that knowingly hosted a massive amount of illegal content, including child pornography, um, online pharmacies, um, and also botnet command and control servers. Uh, in addition to hosting this harmful content, uh, we also proved that Pricework actually collaborated with bot herders to configure, deploy, and actually operate these botnets. And so how did this all begin? Well, it started with uh, a computer intrusion at NASA that was subsequently traced to McColo. Um, and pursuant to a search warrant, um, NASA obtained um, copies of servers and ob obtained a number of different records that ultimately proved to be very critical in the FTC's case. Um, and um, I guess the most important piece of evidence wa uh, was the, the ICQ chat logs because a lot of the data uh, that they collected sort of traced back to 3F, 3FN, which was also the alias that Pricework used for this, this rogue ISP. Um, and these chat logs were transcripts of instant message conversations between various parties that were relayed through the Mikolo servers. And the chat logs, they were initially um, in Russian, but they were, were later trans, um, translated. Uh, they contained a series of discussion between the operators of 3FN and the customers seeking assistance to configure the botnets. Um, and this really sort of proved 3FN's or Pricework's direct involvement in the operation of these botnets. And I'll just read um, just a little uh, excerpt of a conversation from these chat logs. Um, the customer says, let's do it tomorrow. We have not configured it today. Uh, the 3FN employee says, I see. Do you have a big botnet? The customer. It can reach 20,000 online, sometimes even more. 3FN, what about geography? The customer, we'll tell you for sure. 200K bots reached today. 15% of them are USA, Europe, Australia. 3FN, I got it. That's somewhere normal. Customer, yep, bots are waiting for you. So this is the type of evidence <laughs> that we were able to get, um, and uh, it really proved useful in our case. But in addition, in addition to NASA, this case was also significant because it really showed um, sort of the need uh, and the success of cooperation among 
a, a range of different stakeholders from academia and from the private sector. And so in order to prove our case, we had declarations from the University of Alabama, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the Spam House Project, the Shadow Server Foundation, Symantec, and the F FTC's own um, case investigator. And I'll just go through very briefly the contributions of, of each of those. With respect to the University of Alabama, there was a research director for computer forensics who uh, analyzed the content of the domains hosted by 3FN. And they just confirmed that the content was child pornography, uh, spam generation software, pirated uh, music and software, online pharmacies. Um, in addition, that researcher um, provided evidence that 3FN advertised in crewtop.nu, which was, um, I believe, a Russian language forum where alleged criminals uh, discuss spamming and, and some of their other criminal enterprises. In addition, the National Center for Missing, Missing and Exploited Children, um, they maintain a cyber tip line where members of the public, law enforcement agencies um, can report um, any images containing child pornography online. And so Nick Mick analyzed the IP ranges that were controlled by 3FN, um, and as a result of that inquiry, they matched, um, confirmed matches of 500 uh, from, from those reports were actually um, hosted by 3FN. In addition, Spam House also regularly conducts its own analysis of IP addresses, and um, it found IP addresses that were connected to 3FN. They actually called 3FN. Um, the operators were really located in the Ukraine, although they were registered in Oregon with their principal place of business in Belize, sort of highlighting the global nature of these scams. Um, and then they spoke to them, and they would feign sort of compliance and say, OK, well, we'll take them down. And they really, they would just move them to different IP addresses. So at one point in time, um, Spam House discovered that there were 17 different IP addresses controlled by 3FN um, that were home to botnet command and control servers, um, all, all of these on the same network at the same time, um, which was pretty significant. Um, the Shadow Server Foundation also provided similar evidence with respect to IP addresses. Um, and interestingly, they found over 4,500 malware specimens that were sort of linked to 3FN servers for command and control. Um, they also did an, an analysis of those malware programs which showed that they were capable of keystroke logging, password stealing, data stealing, um, and enabling um, spam distribution. Symantec, again, similar types of evidence uh, with respect to uh, the types of attacks um, within the bot command and control activity and the spam and the phishing attacks that, that were uh, connected to the IP ranges controlled by 3FN. And our own expert investigator um, analyzed the who, interestingly, the who is information for price work PriceWord had actually used a, a number of different aliases, and so she connected all of those aliases to PriceWord based on the WIS information. Um, again, she helped secure translations for the chat logs, review complaints, and as part of our investigations, we are able to uh, use computers and get infected as a normal consumer would, and so she did that in the normal course of our investigation, and that actually resulted in eight infections of our, our own FTC computers, um, and the programs varied. Uh, there were redirections to other websites. Um, there were also password sealing programs that were uh, downloaded onto our own computers. And so we uh, showed all of this evidence to the judge, and we um, actually this year successfully uh, got an order liquidating the assets, which were the servers in California. Um, and, and the good news, uh, you know, basically, what's the impact of this shutdown? Uh, well, it's difficult to measure precisely. Uh, the, at, the, at the time, during the initial set shutdown, which was uh, summer of last year, there was a significant drop in spam levels. One estimate was 30 percent, um, but that drop was temporary. And so the bad news is that criminals react to, the, to these takedowns by decentralizing their operations and their ability to operate anonymous, anonymously on the internet, uh, despite the efforts by the law enforcement, security community, and the academic community. So. Um, I just wanted to highlight that for you and say, even though we're doing um, good work and hard work, there's still a lot to do and, and we need to cooperate to do it.